Hello, and welcome back to another day in the arena. It's me, it's CGB, and today in the arena we're doing something very different. It's going to be a set review. We're going to talk about the multicolored and artifact cards in the upcoming the upcoming magic set, War of the Spark. And I'm really excited about the upcoming set and to do this set review, but I'm going to let you know about how it's going to go up front so that you're not surprised at the end and you don't get upset with me potentially because i've done set reviews in the past i've put them up in both broken down by color and i've put them up in a big chunk i've also paid attention to the statistics i know that very few of you watch all the set reviews they tend to be long they don't tend to have gameplay they tend to me be me talking you also tend also my viewers tend to watch the first say set video posted and then not watch many of the others but a good amount of people still do watch the others, and they tend to be my biggest fans. So, we're trying something a little different. The set review, we're going to do this multicolored and artifact set review right here, free, for everybody to watch and enjoy. I chose that because the multicolored cards and the artifact cards are usually some of the most exciting cards in the set. After that, we're going to do the rest of the colors on a set review, but those videos will only be available to the, those who support me on Patreon, those who are Twitch subscribers, and those who hit the join button here on YouTube. We're using this as a bit of a coming out party and a way to provide extra content and promote the join button. So if you notice, if you look just below my screen that's talking on your phone right now, if you scroll down, there should be a button that says join. If you hit that, you enter the club for $4.99 a month. That gets a little bit of exclusive bonus content and something extra every month for supporting my channel. And what the extra stuff is going to be this month is going to be the rest of the set review. You'll get to have the other colors reviewed and get my opinions on them. Now, I'm also not reviewing every single card in the set. I'm avoiding cards that I think are for limited only. So you'll probably only see me reviewing mostly the Planeswalkers, the really good commons and uncommons, and the mythics and the rares. If you are a supporter, if you have hit that join button, and you have a certain card you want my opinion on, you'll be able to message me on Discord and ask my opinion on it, and I'll gladly share what I think of the card. Just know in advance that I might hurt your feelings a little if you're really emotionally attached to things like like magic cards because if I'm not talking about it it's probably because I don't think it's very good to be honest but that's the way it's going to go this first multicolored and um, artifact set review it's free to all in a way it's a try it before you buy it the pressure is really on me if you enjoy the set review if you like the chill background music if you like my take uh, we're going to be talking about constructed standard and best of three and best of one for magic arena not talking about limited limited is best handled by some other experts as i don't play the format much if you search youtube or google for war of the spark limited set review you'll find some high quality people putting out great limited content but that's not me this is going to be a constructed and standard focused set review and i hope you enjoy it so now that we've got that out of the way i hope some of you will consider hitting that join button and joining the cgb family and getting some extra content each month for only $4.99. To put it in perspective, if I make 30 videos a month, somewhere between half an hour and an hour, that's a lot of time. And $4.99 isn't a bad rate for all that content. But of course, it's always up to you. I can't make you subscribe. I have to be worth it. And I'm going to keep trying to do my best as well as putting out a free video every day for everyone to enjoy. Without further ado, let's get into the set review. Our very first card is Dovin, Hand of Control. You see he's got his hand, and he likes control. See how that works? This is a hybrid white-blue and two for a Planeswalker with five loyalty. And artifact, instant, and sorcery spells your opponents cast cost one more to cast, and minus one until your next turn prevent all damage that would be dealt to and bought and by target permanent and opponent controls so this feels like it wants to be in a control deck but it doesn't feel like it 
really targets anything too specifically. The main problems that control decks typically run into is opponents going wide, in which case you need sweepers. This Dovin is not good against a bunch of creatures. It's good against one specific large creature or threat. It's interesting that the minus one can target a Gideon, which is a card I'm sure we'll get to when we go to cover white, uh, and that's a big deal, as it's something a Wrath cannot kill. Also, you can use the minus on other things that Wraths can't kill, like Rekindling Phoenix or a Danto Vanguard, which is, again, adds a little bit of utility to this card. However, since it only minuses and doesn't plus, eventually it runs out. Making your opponent's artifacts, instants, and sorceries cost more isn't very good against an aggro deck. And notice it does not say Planeswalkers, whereas the most relevant types in the format coming up, in my opinion, will be Creatures and Planeswalkers because of the Planeswalker focus of the set. So with that in mind, I'm not very high on Dovin. I don't think you can play it in best of one because it's too narrow. And in best of three, I think the best it can do is a sideboard card. So I would watch the sideboard for the right opportunity to use Dovin Hand of Control. There might be some decks built around the new Sahili that this would be good against. The next card we're going to talk about is Dovin's Veto. So sticking with the Dovin theme, we've got a blue and a white for an instant. It's an uncommon. This spell can't be countered. Counter target non-creature spell. A Planeswalker is not a creature. And this is a Planeswalker set. Oh boy. Also the flavor text uh, leading to a showdown with Chandra. Chandra who hates Dovin so much. He killed her father. <laughs> Unfortunately, it doesn't look like her flamey tricks are going to work, at least not uh, right up front. So, the spell can't be countered and counter target non-creature spell. You win the counter war and you counter something important. If your deck is blue and white and has a good amount of blue and white mana, I think this is a bit better than negate. I Quite a bit better enough that you should be running it. Whether or not you should replace negate outright, well... It's kind of tricky. Do you have basic swamp in your deck? Are you Esper? This could be harder to cast, but I would say most of the time this should replace Negate. It will mostly be a sideboard card, but running one or two of these in your main deck of your deck with plenty of blue and white mana is not and should not be out of the question. This is a very good card and it's going to be, well, a little tilting to lose a counter war out of nowhere. Just picture the opponent with three absorbs in their hand, resolving their Teferi with a whole bunch of mana, and the first thing that happens is a Dovin's Veto. Tilt, I really wonder, just like Niv and just like Nezahal, how often this card will get targeted by absorb. Our next card is Teferi, Time Raveler. Teferi. This is a rare Planeswalker. One white and a blue. Each it has four loyalty. Each opponent can cast spells only any time they could cast a sorcery. Plus one, until your next turn you may cast sorcery spells as though they had flash. Minus three, return up to one target artifact, creature, or enchantment to its owner's hand. Draw a card. This card is probably very good. It's a very unusual one for a Planeswalker. You don't quite see anything just like this. At three mana, it comes down, it can remove a creature, artifact, or enchantment, and you draw a card. That's a pretty big game. Now, if the format is such that the opponents are playing one drop, two drop, three drop, that's just a suicide mission. But if the format is anything slower, or if their draw is anything slower, the tempo gain or loss is huge. Also, this Teferi isn't terrible in a deck with creatures around it. We've become used to blue-white Teferi being all, ab all about control, control, control. But this Teferi will not win the game on its own, and it is best surrounded by creatures and other win cons. Therefore, uh, especially in creating tempo, bouncing an opponent's creature and being able to attack them or further build out your board presence is even stronger. This is a really good card, and I'm curious what kind of decks exactly it will fit in. It's not dead in control mirrors either. If you plus it, uh, just having it on the battlefield makes it impossible for the opponent to use counter spells against you. And when you're plussing it, you can do all kinds of things uh, as though they had flash. So sorceries that you might want to consider flashing in, the first one that comes to mind, Kaya's Wrath. An instant speed board wipe is dramatically better than a sorcery speed board wipe because you can hold up counter magic throughout their turn and then at end of turn play Akaya's Wrath and kill the creatures that they played if they didn't play something that you wish to counter. So 
uh, this card looks to be absurdly good. I think that running three in some blue-white base deck is not out of the question to start the format and figure out how good it is. And I do think that there's probably some creature decks that would enjoy having to ferry the Time Raveler around. The, there's just a lot going on with the card, and it seems like it should be in a lot of places. So, another reason to get sick of Teferi, but maybe he'll finally be the hero that we deserve, as he might be able to back up some blue and white creatures as they beat down, not just plus into Oblivion, exile all our permanents, and let us deck ourselves, because that's so much fun. The next card we'll cover is Time Wipe. This smells like Teferi's handiwork once again. Return a creature you control to its owner's hand and then destroy all creatures. It is two white, white, and a blue. It is a sorcery. It is a rare. It is a board wipe that plays well with a creature of your own. For example, return that Lyra to your hand and then blow up all the things. Honestly though, every time I've played a blue, white, some kind of control deck, I haven't been too worried about blowing up my creature. Kai's Wrath even gives you a life point for blowing up your creature. I just can't really feel like this card is going to be the impact that Kai's Wrath is. Perhaps you can put it into Jeskai control, but is it really better than the flexibility of a Cleansing Nova? I don't know, although the idea of returning your Niv-Mizzet or your Crackling Drake to your hand and then wiping the board is a bit appealing. I just don't see how Jeskai is going to rise above Esper, even with a few more versatile tricks. I'm very skeptical of Time Wipe, and I don't think I'm going to craft it right away, but there are definitely some value -y things that you can do with this that would frustrate the opponent greatly. How about a Sailor of Memes? How about just playing a 3-mana 1-4 and then the next turn wiping the board and getting your 1-4 back so that you have it to block with in the future? Is that a pattern that's good enough? Maybe in some places, but it doesn't sound good enough in standard best of one or best of three to me right now. Our next card is Ashiok Dream Render. One hybrid black, hybrid blue, hybrid black, hybrid blue. That's gonna get fun to say. This is an uncommon legendary planeswalker with five loyalty to start. Spells and abilities your opponent's control can't cause their controller to search their library. And target player puts, for minus one, target player puts the top four cards of their library into their graveyard, exile each opponent's graveyard. So a few things I wanna point out reading the text. Target player puts the top four cards of their library into their graveyard. You can target yourself and then exile each opponent's graveyard. It will not exile your graveyard even if you target yourself. So I think that that's an important little piece to share. So this card does not protect itself. It, it, it fails most of the regular Planeswalker tests of either making a creature or removing something from the battlefield to defend itself. That said, it's probably a little better than it looks. You, if you have any synergy to put the top four cards of your library into the graveyard, then you're getting some, you're getting paid for the card. Something along the lines of Narcomoeba, it's a little too weak for my taste. Creeping Chill, of course, still exists, but you can also simply dump some Chemister's Insights into your graveyard and have access to them. Or you can flip Search for Iskanta really, really fast, as this can come down the turn after the Iskanta. Now, I know some of you are saying, but you didn't do anything. Well, sometimes they just have to attack Ashiok down, and it's like you also gained life, so buying time isn't the worst thing. Exiling each opponent's graveyard can matter in the format. Sultai relies on their graveyard for fine finality. Crackling Drakes rely on the exile pile, but Arclight Phoenix and Enigma Drakes do not, and exiling the graveyard can have a big impact. Even Red needs in, needs cards in their graveyard to make their Gitu Lava Runner have haste and be better than just a 1-2. So there's all kinds of uses for the graveyard. Maybe Mono White doesn't care, but maybe they do. We haven't seen the newest versions of the deck. I don't think that this card is completely dead. I think that you have to be a deck that wants to self-mill though. I don't know that I play this in a mill deck, although I know some people are going to no matter what I say. There's also this part. Spells or abilities your opponent's control can't cause their controller to search their library. Every now and then, 
you might hit a home run off that ability. A Thunderherd Migration that doesn't do anything. Um, Ranging Raptors that whose Enrage trigger doesn't work. I don't know. I have dinosaurs in the brain right now from the video I just made. But there are a lot of other places where the opponents are going to want to search their library. Shut down that Growth Chamber Guardian, for example. Um, so. I don't think this card is quite as bad as it looks, but I don't think you can just jam four into a deck by any means and call it a win con. It's an interesting card that I'll probably try playing one of here and there, and certainly a sideboard card for best of three, and probably not better than a one of or a theme deck card in best of one. Our next card is Enter the God Eternals. Two blue blue and a black for a sorcery. Enter God Eternals deals four damage to target creature and you gain life equal to the damage dealt this way. Target player puts the top four cards of their library into their graveyard, amass four. And this is our first amass card. Put four plus one plus one counters on an army you control. If you don't control one, create a zero zero black zombie army creature token first. So armies are going to be zombie creatures tokens. And there are many cards that say a mass, meaning if you have one of those, you put plus one plus one counters on it. And if you don't have one of those yet, you create one with the counters. So the ability is never dead. Now, this is a really good card. Uh, dealing four damage to a creature, killing it, gaining life equal to the damage dealt this way. So as long as it resolved, the idea is four damage. Then the top four cards into a graveyard for target player again, you're probably looking not for a way to mill your opponent, although some people will obviously try that, but you're probably looking for synergies of your own, putting your top four cards into the graveyard to create more targets for find, or to flip your search for his conta, or to find chemistry's insight. And then you amass four. So at the end of it all, you have a four, four zombie creature token. This is an absurdly good mid-range card and possibly an absurdly good control card. This is another card that Teferi can make cast at instant speed, which is even grosser, as one of the only lines of text that's unfortunate here is it is a sorcery, a tap-out type card. It does require a target, so you need a creature to target with this card. If you do not have one, you can't play it just to mill yourself and make a 4-4, which would make this even better in best of one. As it is, you can probably still run it and should run it in best of one in your mid-range or control deck, but you probably shouldn't run four copies. Two or three should probably be enough. However, if you are running any kind of a best of three deck, it seems like having access to at least three copies and possibly four in your blue and black deck is important. I can see this easily in current Sultai mid-range. I can definitely see this in a Grixis Amass deck that is kind of a new thing that I think will come together with the cards we've seen from the set. I can see this in a blue-black sort of mid-range fake news Demir sort of control-y kind of deck. Just about anything that matches the colors, this is a really strong card. And it's honestly going to be much better at stabilizing these blue and black decks against mono red than Vraska's Contempt has been. So yeah, prepare yourself for Enter the God Eternals. Our next card is Gleaming Overseer. One blue and black for a zombie wizard 1-4. When it enters the battlefield, amass one, meaning it'll make another 1-1 one, one zombie army, or it will put a plus one, plus one counter on a zombie army you already control. Zombie tokens you control have hexproof and menace. So I don't, this, this feels like a limited card to me, but then there's this part where zombie tokens you control have hexproof and menace, which means mainly your armies or any other zombie creatures you make somehow with say a graveyard marshal. And Hexproof and Menace is quite the combo. If you give them Death Touch as well with a Death Baron, those are some formidable zombies, uh, as two creatures would have to block it and the Death Touch would kill both of them regardless of their size. Hexproof is also pretty handy as this is all about amassing. So consider that you have your army and then you amass onto it. So it's a 5-5 five, five zombie army hexproof menace creature. That is a formidable threat and the opponent will have to kill the overseer before they can deal with it. Which is why I wonder if this card is good enough just barely for constructed. I'm not sold, but even having a 1-4 body is not the worst. It's pretty tall against the red decks, which we all know we have to beat first before we can worry about beating anything else. They're the most popular decks in Arena by quite a bit. So I'm going to keep an eye on Gleaming Overseer. I'm not sold, 
but I would like to be, I, I wouldn't be surprised if this showed up in some constructed decks. Next on our list is Soul Diviner. A black and a blue for a 2-3 zombie wizard. That's already a pretty good 2-drop. It is a rare. Remove a counter from an artifact, creature, land, or planeswalker you control to draw a card. So we're thinking, do we want to remove loyalty from our planeswalkers? Well, some of them. And drawing a card, that's a pretty good minus 1 to put on any planeswalker. So that's not bad. Poor Domri, though. Domri's in trouble. Anyway, how about a land? Well, there are some lands coming up we're going to cover. Uh, one in particular is the background here for my set review called Blast Zone that does have counters on it, so we could draw cards that way. How about an artifact? Well, you could remove the treasure map's uh, landmark counters to draw cards without flipping the map, so you can get a scry and you can draw a card, and you can repeat it over and over if you wish to. I don't know if that's really the right play, but it's an option. How about a creature? Lots of things put plus one, plus one counters on creatures in this set, but one of the most common ways in this color combination is a mass. So when you amass and you put a plus one, plus one counter on your zero, zero zombie token, such as uh, we talked about in the last card, you can remove a counter to draw a card. Now that might kill the token if it only had one counter, but if we've amassed onto it a few times, maybe that's not a terrible thing. This can be done at instant speed too, so you could block with your mass creature, remove the token, draw a card, and uh, yeah, on you go. So, I mean, there's there could be a lot of places for this card to work, and the body's not bad. So I think this is completely a constructed playable card if you have enough main deck ways to take advantage of the ability that doesn't really take away from what your deck's trying to do. If you're trying to make the largest possible a mass creature, if that's a huge part of your strategy, then removing counters from it to draw cards, it still seems like there's a time and place for it. So I'm optimistic about this fitting somewhere. It is a little bit like you have to have pretty good two drops in the format or you have to be removing your opponent's two drops. This feels like a mid-rangey two drop, not quite an aggro-y one. But I still think it's a completely playable card, and I hope to see it make the rounds. Tezzeret, Master of the Bridge. We're talking about the Planar Bridge here, folks. For a blue and a black legendary Planeswalker Tezzeret Mythic, and it's the buy a box, but you can craft it. It won't come in booster packs, though. Creature and Planeswalker spells you cast have affinity for artifacts. Affinity is an old school ability, my friends. It means that the more artifacts you have, the cheaper your card is to cast on a one for one basis. So if you control four artifacts and you have a four casting cost affinity for artifact card in your hand, then you may play it for zero. Yeah. Five loyalty, plus two. Master of the Bridge deals X damage to each opponent where X is the number of artifacts you control and you gain X life. Minus three, return target artifact from your graveyard to your hand. And minus eight, exile the top 10 cards of your library. Put all artifact cards from among them onto the battlefield. Whew, how good is an artifact deck right now? Probably not great. We don't quite have that many cheap and high impact artifacts to really pay this off. There will be some fun to be had for sure with Navigator's Compass, Fountain of Renewal, Phylactery Lich, and some treasure maps and nonsense like that. Add in some board wipes, throw in a Tezzeret, throw in a few other cards we're going to talk about soon. Um, there's also an endless sort of loop with a card I never play called Guardians of Koilos, where it comes into play and it can return another one and another one and set up basically so that you have artifacts entering the battlefield over and over for free. What can you do with that? There's a card called Diligent Excavator, which can mill the opponent two cards every time you play a historic card of which artifacts are. So there are some crazy combos. There's probably some jank to be had. I think that this though is a jank card, not a serious constructed card. So for those of you Tezzeret and high level jank fans, this is going to be a very good card for you. For those of us spiky types, I would not craft this card. I would definitely hold off and make somebody prove to you that it has a place in current standard. Our next card is Tyrant Scorn. A blue and a black instant, uncommon. Choose one. Destroy target creature with converted mana cost three or less. And return target creature to owner's hand. Well, there was a card back in my day called Smother, and all it did was for one in a black, destroy target creature with converted mana cost three or less. And it was a very important card. Of course, back then the best creature in magic was Psychotog, which was three mana. However, I don't 
see this being a miss in best of three. I am concerned that it could be a miss in best of one because in best of one, it's very, very dangerous to have cards in your deck that can only target creatures. Uh, also, like, is this better than cast down? It's kind of the spot it's fighting with. I think in a lot of cases, this is potentially better than cast down, but it depends on the legendary creatures that we run into. Are cheap legendary creatures becoming the rage? They might. There are some very strong legendary creatures that we're going to come across here in this very set. But cast down already hits most of what we want to hit. How about the return target creature to its owner's hand? Well, there's a little trick there. If we run creatures ourselves, if creatures are in fact our win cons, then Tyrant Scorn can bounce our own creatures to save them from removal, which would make this less dead against a control deck in best of one. Overall though, I think this is a pretty narrow removal spell for the current meta. I don't think you can run too many of this card. I think it's more of a one or two of. I think most of the time, Cast Down and Moment of Craving are competing with it, and they give you a little bit more, just a little bit more than this card gives. However, if you can get some real play out of the returning target creature to its owner's hand bit, uh, it could be interesting. It's also worth noting that this is in the same uh, color combination as cards like Thought Erasure, Disinformation Campaign, and Nicole Bolas. So bouncing the opponent's creature can lead to it getting discarded if the opponent's empty-handed. It's an interesting card, I just don't know if it's better than Cast Down. Let's keep an eye on it. I'll probably try one or two in a couple of decks and see where it goes from there. Angraf, Captain of Chaos, is our next card. Creatures you control have Menace. Minus two, a mass two. Then we have a casting cost of two hybrid black, hybrid red, hybrid Rakdos. Let's just call it that. Two hybrid Rakdos, hybrid Rakdos. Is this card good? I do not think this card is good. I think that if I had to pay four mana for a card that created two 2-2 two, two zombie army things or one 4-4 four, four zombie army thing, because remember, a mass puts the counters onto an army you already control, and it temporarily had menace. I'm using the term temporarily because if the opponent can even deal one damage to the Angrath after it amasses twice, it doesn't have a plus, so the Angrath will die. I don't think that's a good card. And I hate to say it, but I think that Angrath here is not a good card. It is not a card I'll be trying to play with very much uh, anytime soon. Now, if I turn out to be wrong, it will be because the Planeswalker type is a lot harder to attack than I think it will be. And the fact that it usually does get to crank out a 4-4, a mass army, and then stick around to give it menace, it's okay. Um, it's also a different creature type, so you can amass before, you can kind of choose when to amass. But I still don't think it's a very good card, and not one I'll be focusing on very much. On the other hand, I find Angrath's Rampage to be significantly better than Angrath himself. Black and red. Sorcery. Uncommon, choose one. Target player sacrifices an artifact, target player sacrifices a creature, or target player sacrifices a planeswalker. Yeah. So usually hitting a planeswalker with this is pretty easy as it's hard for the opponent to control too many planeswalkers in standard. We'll see how that changes, how popular those super friends decks might be, but I don't think it'll be that strong. And even if they are, Hitting their Planeswalker for two mana is a good way to get back in the game. On the other hand, hitting a creature is great, and hitting a treasure map is great. So there you go. What more could you ask for for two mana? The sorcery speed is a little bit awkward. If you are on the play and your opponent plays a two mana creature and you have two mana open for the Rampage, you still have to use your next turn to remove it. That can be a little bit awkward because it keeps you from advancing your board. That said, I still think it's totally worth it to have this versatility. This is an especially strong card in best of one, and the only thing that can really hold it back in best of one is the amount of hunted witness that people play, and cards of that nature. But most of the time, you're pretty happy to work your way through the creatures regardless, as they have to die sometime before they kill you. So I'm going to give a very high score to Angrass Rampage. I'm going to craft four of this pretty quickly. I'm going to probably try at least two or three in most decks. I wouldn't be surprised if this is a four of going forward, and I would put it on a list of very powerful spells in the format. Oh, and with Teferi, you can play it at instant speed. You just have to be on a four color control deck. No problem. 
Dreadhorde Butcher is a black and a red for a zombie warrior. It's a rare. It's a 1-1. One, one. It has haste. When it deals combat damage to a player or planeswalker, put a plus one plus one counter on Dreadhorde Butcher. When it dies, it deals damage equal to its power to any target. So I've played with cards like this in the past. Slith Firewalker was a very interesting card. Whirling Dervish was a card from way back in the day. Both of those cards had moments where they were good. Many people will not feel this card is very good because if there's anything in its way on the battlefield, it doesn't actually do much. But the fact that when it dies, it deals damage to a player or planeswalker, um, or when it dies, it deals damage to any target, I'm sorry, um, equal to its power, that's kind of a big deal. It means that the opponent can't do what they would normally do against this type of card, which is, okay, it's a 1-1, one, one, I take 1. It's a 2-2, two, two, I take 2. Now that it's a 3-3 three, three, or 4-4, four, four, maybe I'll wrath the board, kill it, and something else. Um, if the opponent does that, they're still taking a lot more damage, double the damage that they expected to take. I think that that is a big improvement to this type of card. The types are very good. Warrior and Zombie are types that have been named on unclaimed territory in recent memory. Um, and the Zombie thing, especially with a mass, is sort of coming back. So. I think this card is better than it looks, and some people think it looks very good. I'm going to look forward to seeing what I can brew up with a Dreadhorde Butcher. There are some other cards in the set that inspire me to play with pump effects more than I would normally play with pump effects. And since this says when it dies, it deals damage equal to its power to any target, if you pump this with, say, a Collision Colossus and make it a five power creature, the turn it comes down, if it dies, it does five damage to something. That's pretty cool. So I'm looking forward to playing with this card. It's probably something I will try out uh, the very first day that I get my hands on War of the Spark. Mayhem Devil, one black red for a devil. It's uncommon, 3-3. Three, three. So three mana, 3-3. Three, three. It's a already stats. It could do something. And then you need an ability that is useful. So it says whenever a player sacrifices a permanent, Mayhem Devil deals one damage to a target. So right away, we're thinking about decks with Judith the Scourge, Diva, and wait, like Priest of the Forgotten Gods and things like that in Rakdos. But this card has already caused a bit of waves. If you wondered why the price of Smothering Tithe is going up, that's because this is a win con in a deck that can kind of make both players draw a bunch of cards with, say, emergency powers, and then use Smothering Tithe to generate a million treasures. And then you play the Mayhem Devil and you sacrifice all the treasures and the opponent's dead. So while this may fit into some respectable archetypes, potentially, it certainly will make the jank tank. So I'm looking forward to playing some really janky shenanigans with Mayhem Devil and Smothering Tithe. And since I shared that with you here on the set review, get out there, see what you can come up with for that archetype. Widespread Brutality is one black red red sorcery rare. Amass two, then the army you amass deals damage equal to its power to each non-army creature. So, if you are amassing already, if you already have an, if you have no amassed thing, this is two damage to every non-army creature. And if you do have an army, this is two damage plus whatever the army's power is to every creature. It's a pretty strong card, as it's a Chandra's Ignition type effect for a mana less with a built-in body. Is it really good? I do have a Grixis Amass deck in mind that would probably try this card. It's also not, it's a sweeper effect that isn't dead against control. You can always use it just to make a 2-2, two -two, sort of like a Ravenous Chupacabra. That does matter for best of one. Is it better than all the other options? Is it better than a Ritual Set? Well, if you're using the, the Amass mechanic more, uh, this will probably be a very good card. If you're not using the Amass mechanic much, this probably isn't better than Cry the Canarium and other effects like that. So, specifically for a Grixis Amass style deck, I think we're looking at a legitimate contender and a very strong card that will be a key part of the strategy. For any other type of deck, I think it's a pass. So, you can safely avoid this card and crafting this card if you are not all into the Amass style. Domri, Anarch of Bolas. One red and a green for a legendary planeswalker. Rare. Three loyalty creatures you control get plus one plus oh. 
add red or green and creature spells that you cast this turn can't be countered that's a plus and then minus two target creature you control fights target creature you don't control so it's an interesting card for one thing it's an anthem all by itself it pluses all your creatures and if it does nothing else then you have two different modes one is good against control decks it makes it so your creature spells can't be countered and it ramps you now, keep in mind, you do not have to use the red and green mana to cast a creature. You can cast a Vivian Reed off this on turn four, for example. So keep that in mind when you use the card. Then the minus two, target creature you control fights target creature you don't control. As long as your creature is bigger, go ahead and use it to kill off the opponent's things. And this also gives your creatures a buff so you can trade up, supposedly. Your four, your four two Merfolk Branchwalker can go take on a bumped Gruul Spellbreaker from the opponent or their Nicol Bolas. So the deck, the card is good in both modes. I think that it's clear that you want to play it with a lot of creatures. It's in Gruul, so that's not a problem. Is it better than Rhythm of the Wilds? I think so. It can generate card advantage by making your cards uh, fight each other. It doesn't grant haste. I think that it is a very different card from Rhythm, so it's a tough comparison. But would you want one or two of these in your red green creature deck? I think the chances are good that you would. And I'll definitely craft at least one to try it out. I'm not 100% that the card is very good. I think it will depend on the meta and which mode you are using more often and how effective those modes are. For example, if there are enough things that say creatures you control can't be countered or enough cards like Domri and Teferi in the meta making counter spells bad, then your opponent's control deck will probably just play board wipes. And then it doesn't, this doesn't really do anything if your creatures get wiped out. So when I say it's a meta approach, that's what I mean. And I'll probably craft one to see where it goes and then decide whether or not I need to craft more. I find Domri's Ambush to be a very good card. Put a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control. Then that creature deals damage equal to its power to target creature or planeswalker you don't control. Red and a green, sorcery. It is too bad it is not an instant. If it were an instant, it would be the best removal spell in the color combination right now, most likely. Obviously, you need to play this in a creature deck. It's very important to note, you can use it to put a counter on your creature whether or not you want it to fight something. All right. And also, remember that it can fight Planeswalkers. It doesn't have to be opposing creatures. That can be a very big deal when the opponent goes for their Teferi. So, I like Domri's Ambush. I think that immediately I'll be trying two to four of them in my red-green creature strategies. And I think it might just be better than all the other options like Thrash Threat, possibly better than Lightning Strike. Creature sizing really matters in red-green decks most of the time. There are ways that the meta could break to make this a very bad card. For example, if the meta is overladen with instant speed removal spells and um, they are pretty cheap and they can kill most of the important cards. But that makes a card like Gruul Sp Spellbreaker even better because Gruul Spellbreaker has Hexproof on your turn, making it the perfect card to use Domri's Ambush with. So I'm very high on Domri's Ambush. I think it will be a very important card for the Gruul decks and I'll be crafting it right away. I find this next card to be really cool. It reminds me of a card called Stormbind from Ice Age. This is Living Twister. It is a rare creature elemental. It's a 2-5. Apparently the biggest booty in the land goes to a Living Twister. Who knew? I will never look at Twisters the same way again. One in a red. Discard a land card. Living Twister deals two damage to any target. That is a player, that is a creature, that is a planeswalker. One green, return a tap land you control to its owner's hand. This is obviously a card kind of built to have big effects in late games. Um, obviously, you aren't going to want to discard lands too often or return lands to your hand too often if you are in kind of the early game. There are some interesting things with stuff like Wayward Swordtooth and Landfall cards. There's one that proliferates in the set uh, where you could be bouncing your land, playing it again, proliferating over and over. The card has enough applications that's going to be interesting. Is it actually good? I don't think so. Um, there's certainly a way that the format could break that a 2-5 body on its own does a lot and then late in the game having an extra ability is okay, but I don't think that's very likely. I don't think the card is strong enough, but there might be some really fun combos to build around it, ways to get, say, all these lands onto the, onto the battlefield, then into your hand, then channel them all into damage. 
This smells of a jank tank card to me, not a spikes corner card. So we'll be getting janky with Living Twister at some time, at some point. I guarantee it because I think the card is cool. Don't get me wrong, but I don't think you'll be seeing it at the top of the mythic ladder anytime soon. Samut, Tyrant Smasher. Two, Gruel and Gruel. Legendary Planeswalker Samut is uncommon. Creatures you control have haste, and the minus one is target creature gets plus two, plus one, and gains haste until end of turn. Scry one. So why does it say creatures you control have haste and then give things haste? That's because if you minus it for the last time, when it's on one loyalty and you minus it, you still give haste to the creature you target. Otherwise, the feel bads would be off the chart. So uh, that is why the redundant text. So is this card good? Probably not very good, but there is something to it. There is always something to a card that says creatures you control have haste. There's usually some janky combo that creates a bunch of mana, spews out a bunch of creatures, and then gives them all haste. I'll give you an example. Polyraptor. Go off with Polyraptor, give them all haste. Sure, we had Regisaur Alpha, but Regisaur Alpha also would often die. Uh, whereas Samut, the opponent may just let Samut sit on the battlefield, only to end up hasting everything. There's probably some other great tricks as well. So the jank tank is going to keep some mood in mind. Keep your eye open for ways to put a million things onto the battlefield and think of how nice it would be if you could attack with them right away. Next up is a Johnny, the great hearted. Ah, I can't wait to hear his voice lines. Two and a green and a white. A legendary planeswalker Ajani is a rare. Creatures you control have vigilance. Not a throwaway line, that's for sure. Creatures with vigilance can block too. And plus one, gain three life. Holy crap. Minus two, put a plus one plus one counter on each creature you control and a loyalty counter on each other planeswalker you control. So buff your squad, buff your walkers. Ajani is such a bro. He makes everybody feel better. Is this card good? Well, against control, probably not. Uh, the opponent doesn't really have to do anything about it, and when it minuses, it sort of just makes things better that the opponent would kill anyway. So against control, this is a completely ignorable card, and that's about 20-ish, probably 15 to 20% of the meta most of the time. However, against aggro, against everything aggro, Oh my god, this card is so impossible to race. The plus one takes it to six loyalty, and you gain three life, and the creatures no, can attack without tapping. So the creatures will, that you control will always be untapped to defend a Johnny. The three life is going to keep going up, so even if you have a flyer, the race is going to be hard. And if you attack a Johnny, it still has six loyalty. Each time you attack it, it's like you gave up damage that could have gone to the opponent's face. That means when you plus one a Johnny once, it's like you gain nine life on turn four, and it just gets worse from there. And it has this ability that threatens to make everything more powerful. This card in green-white base creature decks is such a house. Uh, it works with tokens, because even your tokens gain vigilance, and you can buff them all. And it works with kind of an angels type package, where you just want to buy enough time for your creatures to take over the game. And it's... God, I love it. I really like this card. Is it going to absolutely warp the format? Only for aggro decks. Only for red decks. So it's probably more of a sideboard card than a main deck card, but for best of one... I'll be playing at least two copies in anything green-white, I think. Um, as long as it's a, a creature-based green-white strategy, I'm going to have a Johnny the Great-Hearted in there because I just think that red decks are going to get wrecked by this card, and I absolutely love it. So that is my take on a Johnny. Go get him, Tiger. Watley's Raptor is a Vigilance 2-3 for a green and a white, and when it enters the battlefield, proliferate. That means choose any number of permanents or players and give each another counter of a kind already there. Now that's an interesting ability. It's not always intuitive, but for example, if a Watley's Raptor proliferates and you choose a Johnny, it gets an extra counter. If you choose your opponent's Planeswalker, it gets an extra counter. I don't think you want to do that. But if you choose your opponent's creature with a minus one, minus one counter, it gets an additional minus one, minus one counter. If you choose your creature with a plus one, plus one counter, it gets an additional plus one, plus one counter. If you choose 
a say saga of your opponents that you don't want to go off like say the eldest reborn it gets an additional counter <laughs> and it takes another turn to go off if you choose a treasure map it gets an additional landmark counter so interesting cards with proliferate and this is one of the cheapest ones with a decent body so i think that if you're going to proliferate this will be one of the cards that you want to do it with and i expect there to be some interesting shenanigans with proliferate for sure if you have seven creatures and they all have plus one plus one counters from venerated loxodon or johnny the great hearted this puts more counters on them so it's almost a sure thing that proliferate will make some waves somewhere and i think this is one of the better proliferate cards so i'll be crafting four of these and trying out a proliferate deck early on not only that it's a dinosaur, and that can matter for a few things. Uh, the dinosaur tribe is good, but it hasn't had too many cheap options that are very good. Raptor Hatchling, for example, has been about it. But you can commune for dinosaurs, and get this, you can commune on turn one, play this on turn two, although I don't think you're proliferating much at that point, which is a bit of a problem. <laughs> anyway, you get my point. Uh, there are there it is a good tribe it does have a good ability the body's decent we should be playing with this card in some decks where the proliferate matters Hawatli, the sun's heart two and a green and a white legendary planeswalker Hawatli with seven loyalty it's uncommon each creature you control assigns combat damage equal to its toughness rather than its power and minus three you gain life equal to the greatest toughness among creatures you control oh my god it's another Arcades. It's another High Alert. Slowly roll. The card does not give defenders the ability to attack. So if you are running the defender deck, you're going to need High Alert or Arcades to handle that job. Very important that we know that up front. However, if you are running that deck, running a couple of Hawatlis isn't a terrible idea. When this card is on the battlefield, if the opponent attacks into your walls, they deal a lot of damage to the opponent's creatures, possibly wiping them out. So. I think this card has a place in that basically meme deck. I don't think that deck will be competitive. I don't think it is competitive. I don't think that's ever going to change. But we can meme just a little harder with our Katie's and High Alert with our buddy Hawatli. I wonder what song she's going to sing next. My strength is our strength and stuff like that. Next up is Tulsimir, friend to wolves. Two, green, green, and white. Legendary creature, Elf Scout with a rarity of rare. When Tulsimir, the friend to wolves, enters the battlefield, create Voja, friend to elves, a legendary 3-3 three, three green and white wolf creature token. It sounds weird that they have to de declare their friendship. It's like they're going through customs. I declare I am a friend to the elves. I declare I am a friend to the wolves. It's kind of bizarre. Whenever a wolf enters the battlefield under your control, you gain three life, and that creature fights up to one target creature you control. You don't control. This has been changed to may. This creature may fight up to one target creature you don't control. It was like instant errated, I heard. And that's very important, because if the opponent controlled a creature bigger than your wolf, it would just immediately die and make everything sad. So I believe that this was immediately changed, and you'll probably see the correct text in Arena because digital works that way. So, this is at 3-3. It enters the battlefield for 5 mana. It creates another 3-3. Three, three. So, 6 power, 6 toughness for 5 mana. Pretty good. Um, you gain 3 life. Sweet. And you fight target creatures. So, if the opponent has something with less than 2 power and, less, and 3 or less toughness, you get to kill something. That's a lot of stats and a lot of value. I like the card. 5 mana is a lot. It's pretty hard to have too many good fives in your deck. Lyra, Dawnbringer, Trostani, Discordant, things like that. But I think it would be I think it would be silly not to have at least one Tulsimir in the deck. And what I'm probably going to do is craft or open one and put it in my green and white decks for a while and see if I really, really want more than that. How easily the card dies, how often you get to fight something relevant, how important it is to gain that three life and stabilize the board in the meta. I do think this is a very good card. I'm not sure how many I would play. I would probably only craft one to get started, whether in best of one or best of three. I do think it will be a better sideboard card for best of three, but still probably not more than a two of. We will see. I could be very wrong. The meta could break in such a way that you just want four of this card, that you always want to be playing Lanoir Elf, Incubation Druid, and this card. Always, always, always. So. 
Keep an eye on Tulsimir. It's a lot of stats packed into a card. Our next card is Cruel Celebrant. White and a black for a 1-2 creature vampire. Uncommon. When Cruel Celebrant or another creature or planeswalker you control dies, each opponent loses one life and you gain one life. So, <laughs> whichever side wins, I'm sure the banquet will be superb. This is the Blood Artist type vampire based effect that we were waiting for for Mardu Aristocrats to Matter. Uh, that deck where we basically sacrifice all of our own things to create all kinds of damage loops on our opponent is pretty freaking sweet. Uh, it also says when a Planeswalker dies, which is interesting, not an effect those cards have had before. And it does have to be something you control, so we don't get something out of killing our opponent's things. So, we're looking at Priest of the Forgotten Gods for some payoff here. Gaining one life helps you buy time, which is something that the current version of the deck had a lot of trouble with. It would often play its Priest of the Forgotten Gods, that would die, and then the deck would get run over by red. Now they have to kill this or else you keep gaining life every turn. And if you can play this on a turn when multiple things die for whatever reason, whether you set it up or your opponent, you can gain a whole bunch of life and deal a whole bunch of damage. So finally, the whole Kaya's Wrath, your own creatures thing comes to fruition. I'm going to craft four of this card. I'm going to brew around this card. I'm going to try to find a version of that aristocrat strategy that works. And it's going to be a lot of fun. Despark is a white and a black for an instant uncommon exile target permanent with converted mana cost four or greater. Interesting card. Uh, th takes me back to Reprisal. And the fact that it hits a permanent means this can exile things like the Immortal Sun, things like Teferi. Now there are, oh, Experimental Frenzy. So there are decks that just run nothing that is four or greater. And obviously if people play this card more and more and more, then you're going to want to run less four drops because this is definitely a tilting card to come up against as it trades very favorably. And the cost of it, of course, is that it sits in your hand doing nothing if you're getting beaten down by small creatures and cheap effects. So what? how many do you play? Is it good? I will definitely craft these or open them and I will definitely play at least one in my black and white decks. Um, that aren't creature based because I think if you're creature based I don't know that you necessarily want to run this you may just need a better threat density I don't know if this grow goes in my deck with cruel celebrant when I could play mortify or conclave tribunal and have all-out versatility in my couple of removal spots but anything mid-range or controlly like esper control I'm going to try a copy of dispark and I look forward to seeing how often it's good how often it's useful and how often I wish it were something else and how often I'm getting beaten to death with it sitting in my hand. This is probably uh, a card you could go up on in sideboarding as well. Having two of these, maybe three in sideboard can make some sense in the right meta. It's a good card and I like it. It comes with a lot of modes, options, flexibility. Exiling the Immortal Sun is going to matter a lot, I think in the new format. So keep your eye on Dispark, get yourself a few copies, but don't go overboard. I think that, much like Negate, this is a 1 or a 2 of, not a 3 or a 4 of. Kaya Bane of the Dead is a card I'm actually not going to read to you, because it's not very good. 6 mana is too much for a Planeswalker, it might exile one creature, then die. But 6 mana for that effect really is not good, and making your opponents lose Hexproof is ridiculous. I'm just pointing out that this card is not good, not all Planeswalkers will be good, and I'm not going to read all Planeswalkers. Sorry. Still love you though, Kaya, in your three mana form. Oath of Kaya, on the other hand, is a legendary enchantment for one white and black, and it is rare. When it enters the battlefield, it deals three damage to any target and you gain three life. Whenever an opponent attacks a planeswalker you control with one or more creatures, Oath of Kaya deals two damage to that player and you gain two life. I like this card quite a bit, probably more than it deserves. This probably isn't more than a one or a two of. I like the life gain built into a removal spell. It can hit any target, which means it's pretty solid in best of one or best of three. It's a good follow up to an opponent minusing their Teferi. You can just kill their Teferi and there'll surely be other planeswalkers to target as well. You can also go face with this card. 
which is pretty sweet because it also makes it even harder then for the opponent to attack a planeswalker you control or because the damage keeps going face and you gain the life, which makes attacking planeswalkers even more punishing. I think that in a super friends deck, this is definitely a one of or two of. I think in Esper Control, this is probably a one of. It's also important that it puts a permanent on the battlefield. This is good with a card like Lich's Mastery, so you have something to exile when you take damage and you draw cards with the mastery. This is also important uh, with cards like Final Payment, which say sacrifice an enchantment instead of pay five life to destroy target creature. or And that can be very sweet. So there's a lot of places where this could really function and work with something. Anything that says sacrifice a permanent, this is a permanent that generated value on the way in and you don't mind sacrificing. How competitive is it? Sideboard and maybe one of or two of in like an Esper control. The rest of the time, I think that there's plenty of like kind of jank synergy with this card and it might make it in into some other places as well. I'm excited about it being in the format. I like Oath of Kaya. Soren the Vengeful Bloodlord is two white black. It is a rare planeswalker with four loyalty. As long as it's your turn, creatures and planeswalkers you control have lifelink. I have always wanted to give my Chandra lifelink, just saying. Soren, the Vengeful Bloodlord, deals one damage to target player or planeswalker. And keep in mind, your planeswalker has lifelink, so you gain one life. It's one damage and gain one life. Minus X, return target creature card with converted mana cost X from your graveyard to the battlefield. That creature is a vampire in addition to its other types. So, is the card good? It doesn't defend itself traditionally, but here's the fact. This is a card that goes in a deck full of creatures already. So your creatures have to defend your sword. When you plus it, it is a four mana planeswalker that goes up to six loyalty, which is pretty high in planeswalker terms. And remember, in theory, you already have creatures, or you can minus it and immediately get back a creature. Here's a play pattern that I like. Let's think about this. Maybe we don't need our Soren to stick around on the battlefield to have a huge impact. Maybe we're the white aggro deck in a mirror or against the red deck. And we drop our Soren and we attack with like two or three creatures, gain like six to eight life. Then we minus and get one of the creatures that died in combat back from the battlefield onto the graveyard. At this point, if the opponent untaps and attacks to kill Soren, they have to attack through a creature, so they probably have to give something up in the exchange. And they, or if they use a spell, you already gained a ton of life and got back a creature from combat. I think Soren's better than it looks. I don't think it's great. I think at most it's a two of. I don't think you can run too many in a deck. I will likely craft one or two, play them in the Orzhov Aristocrat style deck, and play them in kind of a white black aggro y type deck. Maybe we can splash black into the typical mono white shell to run a little bit of variety, but. Is it better than an unbreakable formation? Probably not. So, uh, the vampire deck or something of that nature, it's going to enjoy Soren. Soren will definitely make some waves in vampire deck that I'm going to play. Probably more of a jank tank type effect. But is there a Mardu type deck that can really benefit from this with Judith, the Scourge Diva, Hero of Precinct 1? I bet there is. I think that Mardu Humans is really the right place. And I bet running one or two of this is better than running, say, a Tesa because it affects all of your creatures. So consider this like a Tesa upgrade. And yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. Mardu Soren. That'll be fun. Rawls Outburst is three damage. It Well, it's four mana, two blue and red, instant, uncommon. Three damage to any target. Look at the top two cards of your library. Put one into your hand and the other into your graveyard. So at first people really like this because it's value and removal tied into one card. The fact that it can go to any target, including face or planeswalkers, makes it good for best of one. The problem that I have with the card is that the rate isn't as good as it looks. It's um, look at the top two cards of your library, put one in your hand, the other in the graveyard, and three damage to a target, that's four mana. If you had an opt and you had a lightning strike, well, that would be three mana. So you're paying slightly above rate for a little bit of value in one card. That said, the card is not bad. I think that it is a one of or a two of though, not a four of. Now, I could be proven wrong over time on this, but I think that's where I would start working with this card. One of or two of, and see how it goes from there. 
I think that most of the time you need to get paid a little more and the versatility is useful, but you don't wanna pay the cost and have a completely versatile deck that is low powered. So this adds a little burst, this needs to add a little bit of versatility to a deck that's already powered. I'm about a medium. I'm lukewarm on Rawl's Outburst. I'll try a little bit of it. Rawl Storm Conduit is two and a blue and a red. For a legendary Rawl Planeswalker, that is rare. Whenever you cast or copy an instant or a sorcery spell, Rawl Storm Conduit deals one damage to target opponent or Planeswalker, plus two to scry one, minus two, when you cast your next instant or sorcery spell this turn, copy that spell. You may choose new targets for the copy. This card has infinite combos baked into it. If you haven't seen it yet, um, you this is the kind of thing you see sometimes on Twitter or Reddit going around. You can minus the raw, and you can is if you have some combination of an expansion explosion and another expansion explosion or a double cast and any other spell or any spell of the opponents, say even an opt, you can go infinite looping, making as many of that spell as you want to. If it's a lightning strike, you just deal lethal damage or a shock. If it's an opt, you can draw your deck and get that lightning strike and set it off that way. The card is pretty wacky. I'm not going to describe to you exactly how the loop works because honestly, I gotta play with it myself. It's one of those things I just have to play with before I understand, but I trust smart people whose work I read. So yeah, this card is pretty cool. Putting together infinite loops to end the game as opposed to sit around doing nothing is going to be very fun. The plus two scrying one is six loyalty. That's really high to deal with a planeswalker, so you probably have to kill it with a spell. And in that case, you kind of got a one for one exchange, plus you got to look at the top card of your library. And uh, also, like any spell that loops, this deals one damage to target opponent or planeswalker. You don't need a lightning strike to finish the game. You could just use the opt. I totally forgot about the stack ability. Just skipped right over it. Crazy. So yeah, it's kind of a way to go off and combo kill your opponent on a planeswalker. That's pretty cool. Um, I think that without question, we're going to explore that side of the card. As far as acting like a fair magic card where we just want to copy our spells every now and then and deal an extra damage. I don't think that's good enough. Um, I don't think that four mana and then getting a scry out of it and sometimes copying a thing is really great. I mean, maybe you try one of these in a Jeskai control deck so that you can double your chemister's insights or double your deafening clarions more often. Maybe. Um, I'm just not sure. I'm not I'm not sold on that. I am sold on trying to get awesome combos to go off. So I'll definitely craft one or two copies of Rawl. And this may be one of those Planeswalkers that you want to craft four copies of because it will be part of a combo deck. And what you want in your combo deck is redundancy. So yeah, uh, I think Rawl's pretty good. Look forward to trying out the combo version in a Jank Tank episode in the future. Roll Reversal lets you exchange control of two target permanents that share a permanent type. It is two blue and a red. It is a sorcery. So it's kind of interesting to think that you can exchange, say, a land with your opponent for whatever reason. <laughs> Maybe you have some horrible land in your deck that just produces colorless mana like Zephyr and Void, and you're like, here you go, mana screw you. <laughs> Although that's really hard to cast with blue, blue, and red in the cost. So that's probably not very likely to work out. Um, how about exchanging creatures? I mean, maybe you can exchange like a Siren Storm Tamer for your opponent's Niv. I don't know. This card doesn't strike me as insanely great, but insanely fun. And there is probably some goofy stuff we'll do in the near future. And then you can also play it with like bounce spells, blink effects or say Teferi, the new Teferi, and return the thing that you gave the opponent to your own hand, takesies backsies style. I don't think that this is gonna break the format or anything. I'm probably not going to craft it. I'm probably gonna wait till I acquire it by opening packs, but I think it will be very fun. It's a, it's a cute little card, but I don't think it's like, I don't think you're going to see it in Mythic anytime soon. I would not be surprised to see Sahili, the Sublime Artificer in Mythic sometime soon. One hybrid is it, hybrid is it. Legendary Planeswalker Sahili. Whenever you cast a non-creature spell, create a 1-1 one, one colorless servo artifact token. Target artifact you control. Okay, this text is funky. Minus two. 
target artifact you control, like say a servo, becomes a copy of another target artifact or creature you control until end of turn, except it's an artifact in addition to its other types. So if it targeted a creature, it would be an artifact creature, I guess. Well, <laughs> editor test. Did the editor cut that sneeze from the video? I'm watching you, editor. So, minus two. Target artifact you control becomes a copy of another target artifact or creature. So, the main thing I look at and see here is how sweet this would be if you play it on turn three in your Is It Drake's deck. Then you play like a Crackling Drake, okay? Uh, and then the next turn, you play a charter course, an opt, probably several of these things. Uh, you make a bunch of servos, you can minus two and turn one of them into a crackling drake until end of turn, so it has absurd power and toughness, but that doesn't give it haste, so you still have to make the servo and then the next turn copy the drake. So, uh, but obviously it fits into that is it play a bunch of spells and because it's hybrid man in the cost it also fits into mono blue that plays a bunch of spells so this is like a murmuring mystic that's cheaper and it can also do some pretty neat stuff turning your servo into a tempest in for a turn might be incredibly strong so i do think this card is going to make some waves and i look forward to trying it in the mono blue shell i look forward to trying it in the drake shell and probably in something i haven't quite thought of yet so i'm going to craft up Sahili. It's uncommon. There's nothing to lose. Let's do it. Casualties of War is two black, black, green, green. Rare. Choose one or more. Destroy target artifact. Destroy target creature. Destroy target enchantment. Destroy target land. And destroy target planeswalker. So I'm going to throw this out there because we're talking about Golgari. We're talking about Sultai. We're talking about like mid range mirror y stuff. What if you play it and you destroy a creature, a land, and a Planeswalker. If you get those three for six mana, is that worth it? I would say definitely yes. That sounds pretty awesome to me. Um, the I, I think it will be one of those bucket list type quests to get all five out of the card one time. I think that's going to be pretty hard to do, but there are places and times it could happen. Just imagine blowing up your opponent's treasure map and their search for his Kanta and their Crackling Drake and their Teferi and their only white source <laughs> anyway that's magical christmas land i do like this card um i like it specifically in the sultai midrange type deck but i just don't know if you can put it in your deck for best of one it's a little bit too slow it's a little bit too mm, but it can help you clean up it can help you kind of clean up an experimental frenzy right you can kill the frenzy kill their goblin chain whirler blow up a land for good measure Maybe it's not terrible. Maybe it's good enough. But yeah, I'll definitely try it out in my Sultai deck. Probably just one. See how often I'm just killing a creature and a land or a planeswalker and a land and wish this was something more efficient and cheaper. But uh, it's a really exciting card. My evaluation on this is it really depends on the format. What what decks are you playing the most often? What permanent types are they using? It's a very contextual. I think it's a sideboard card for best of three and probably just a one of even at that. So I would not craft more than one up front. Death Sprout is one black, black, green, instant, uncommon, destroy target creature, search your library for a basic land card, put it onto the battlefield tapped, then shuffle your library. Well, there's a few issues with it. Issue number one, destroy target creature. I don't think you can run it in best of three, or in best of one, I'm sorry, because you might, it, there are enough cards now that can destroy any permanent, can have any target, or destroy target creature or planeswalker, that I think you should run those instead in best of one. In best of three, if you run this card, you do have to have basic lands in your deck. And we have mana bases right now that aren't too high on basics, but can still run a couple. But there is a cost to it, especially when you're talking about a black, black, green, mana cost also like what are we killing and what are we we ramping into you can play a vraska a turn early i'm talking about the big six mana vraska i suppose that's all right but i also don't know that that's necessary i'm not very high on death sprout the way that other people are i like that it's an instant i do like that you get some extra value and kill something 
I just don't know if it's better than Ravenous Chupacabra, better than Hostage Taker. I think a body is generally worth a lot more than getting a basic land. And yeah, I'm going to, that's where I'm going to land on the card for now. Leyline Prowler. One black and a green for a 2-3 Death Touch Lifelink Nightmare Beast that taps for one mana of any color. So it's Vampiric, it, it, it's Nighthawk. It's um, the Vampiric Nighthawk, but without uh, flying. Instead, we get a mana ability. I think this card looks really sweet. I'm very curious to see the effect on the format. Obviously, it feels like it needs to be lightning struck like right away by the red deck. They can't really afford to try to trade with this in combat, although the Chain Whirler can still attack right through it. I, in other spots like mid range, you're ramping your mana, so you can play a turn 5 Vivian Reed or something else in that 5 spot. And it fixes mana, so if you're running a 3 color deck, you can use this to make a better Hydroid Crisis, for example. I think it's a really good card. I honestly think that the lifelink ability of it, as well as the ramp ability of it, may mean that you can replace the Wild Growth Walker package. You may not need that kind of effect anymore if you have something that gains you life early enough, like the Prowler here. Or maybe you play it with them, I'm not sure. It definitely screams Golgari and Sultai midrange to me, but maybe there's even more to it than that. Maybe there is some kind of Jund, or even other things that I'm not quite thinking of. So, it's an exciting card. It's definitely good. Will it end up being a four of in some constructed deck? Maybe at some point in the format, it will definitely at least get tested. It could turn out to be low powered, but as long as there is any kind of creature combat going on on the ground, it's a must kill threat because it just trades with their best thing or makes mana or gains life. It's quite the, uh, quite the package. I'm crafting for Leyline Prowlers, and I can't wait to try the card out and see what effect it has on decks that try to attack on the ground. Name check time. The store of Dev Karin Lich is one black black green. It is a 5-4 legendary creature zombie elf wizard. It is rare. Trample. All right, I'm already exhausted. What else you got? Whenever the Lich deals combat damage to a player or planeswalker, return to your hand target creature or planeswalker card in your graveyard that wasn't put there this combat. So I think it's interesting that it can return a planeswalker and it says it wasn't put there this combat, meaning when you can minus your planeswalker to death, so it goes to the graveyard, then attack and get it back. So this is strictly for creatures that aren't put there this combat, and it's probably so that it can't loop itself, is what that clause is really for. But it's important to note that if another creature dies in combat, you can't get it back in the same combat with the Lich. So that's a lot of stats. Um, four mana for a 5-4 trample is not a joke. The types are good. Zombie, Elf, and Wizard could all matter in various decks, and that's a bit exciting. The ability is interesting, sort of requires you to fill your graveyard a little, and it does have to connect to have value. So there's definitely a good chance that this store of card is a miss. Uh, the fact that you it has kind of a prohibitive cost, the double black might be hard, and it does have to hit to do something immediately, means that traditionally cards like this are considered bad because a chupacabra just eats it and nothing really happened and you got two for one. The four toughness also allows it to get lava coiled or um, any minus that deals four damage or sweeper that deals four damage will hit it. With all that said, this is probably more along the lines of a jank tank card. Isarath is a similar type effect, though this one can get a planeswalker, which could be really nice. More Vraskas, sounds fun. But I'm going to call, I'm not, I don't think I'm going to craft this card. And maybe at some point it will be a Jank Tank card. I don't know if it will be much of a format definer. However, if I open one, I will probably throw one into my Golgari or Sultai mid range deck and try it out once or twice. Just see how it goes. Vraska Swarm's Eminence is two black, green, black, green. And it is a legendary Planeswalker Vraska. It's uncommon. And she says, whenever a creature you control with death touch deals damage to a player or planeswalker, put a plus one, plus one counter on that creature. And minus two, create a one, one black assassin creature token with death touch. And whenever this creature deals damage to a planeswalker, destroy that planeswalker. I think it is really, really sweet to create creatures that have death touch for planeswalkers. I've always felt like death touch should kill a planeswalker. Um, but... And now we have a creature that does that. But with that said, 
I'm not excited about Vraska Swarm's Eminence. There might be a Death Touch Tribal deck we're going to build for the Jank Tank. That could be very, very fun. But as far as a competitive deck, I think that's a very narrow window of special skills that Vraska and her Death Touch friends like Hired Assassin will have. And I don't think that's going to be competitive enough in Standard. So uh, Vraska is not a hit for me. Instead, I'm going to probably just build some Death Touch Tribal and have some fun with it at some point. Feather the Redeemed. This is a red, white, white, legendary creature angel. It is a 3-4 flyer. Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell that targets a creature you control, exile that card instead of putting it into your graveyard as it resolves. If you do, return it to your hand at the beginning of the next end step. So, this is one of the few cards in the set that, in my opinion, completely enables all new archetypes. I think that we've had a few very strong sets with Ravnica, Allegiance, and Guilds, and that those decks that have come out of them are going to be very strong for quite a while. In addition to that, we have the Dominaria decks, which are basically Esper because of Teferi, the hero of Dominaria, and the monocolored decks because of cards like Tempest Shin and Goblin Chain Whirler and Benelish Marshall. Those decks also aren't going to make use of a lot of the cards here in these sets. However, there are a few new decks. Um, this is a throwback to a deck called Heroic, which would use pump spells. And I actually think that pump spells have a new place in the format. There are a few value pump spells like Defiant Strike that we'll get to later in the set review. But like cards like that can draw cards. And with Feather, you can play those cards over and over again. Notice that it says targets a creature you control. It does not have to target Feather. So if the opponent is holding up removal and you think they plan to kill the Feather, you can always target a different creature uh, and force them to kill that creature to keep your Feather. If you have another Feather because they're legendary in your hand, you can target the Feather, get the removal to go there, and then set up those cards for the future. It's also interesting that this can create loops with removal spells. For example, Reckless Rage is a card that you could use to deal 4 damage to the opponent's creature and 2 damage to a target creature you control, meaning that it would be exiled and returned to your hand with Feather. You could do it on your turn and then again on your opponent's turn and continue to loop it, killing things all the time. This makes Feather a pretty must-kill creature, or the opponent must be able to kill any other creature you have that is being targeted by an instant or sorcery. So I think this card is really absurd, and there's no way, no way I'm not going to craft four and try to play decks with this card. It's, it's different, it's something unique, and it's going to be a lot of fun. I look forward to putting up a Feather the Redeemed deck for you very early in War of the Spark season. Solar Blaze is one of many sweepers in the set. Each creature deals damage to itself equal to its power. It is a two red white sorcery. So it's pretty fun that you can do a few unique things with this. One is if your creatures have lifelink, you gain a bunch of life. If your opponent's creatures have lifelink, they gain a bunch of life. That's it's kind of funky with Soren that we can uh, wrath ourselves and gain a bunch of life. I also think it's interesting that you can build a deck around high toughness creatures and turn this into a one-sided board wipe. So if you have cards in your deck like Feather the Redeemed and Ava not Avacyn, um, Aurelia, the Exemplar of Justice. Aurelia is even quoted on the card. It's a, it's a hint. You see that? It's a hint. Then um, those big booty cards will survive the sweeper, while the opponent's high power cards may not. And if we are in a format full of high power cards, very aggressive things, I'm thinking most of the mono white deck, most of the mono red deck, pretty much the entire mono blue deck except for Surge Mare, then this could be a really interesting way to wipe the board from one side only. So at the same time, is it better than Deafening Clarion? Would Deafening Clarion have done a very similar effect? Well, not if the opponent has cards like Steel Leaf Champion and Nullhide Ferox, which this kills, as well as Galta. So I think there's definitely spots for Solar Blaze. I don't like that it's a Sorcery Speed Sweeper in Best of One where the opponent may not have creatures it can hit. So it's a risky card to play in best of one. I think it's a proper sideboard or main deck card in best of three, and that I'll probably try to build some kind of high toughness kind of deck to theme out with Solar Blaze at some point in the format. But to start the format, I'll probably open or craft one or two and try them in a few spots here and there, in Jeskai Control, in maybe some kind of an Angel deck. We'll see. It's, I think it's okay, and I think it's different from the average sweeper. 
10th District Legionnaire has haste. It is a red white human soldier 2 2. So, right away, two mana. Relevant types, human and soldier, 2 2. Haste. Whenever you cast a spell that targets the 10th District Legionnaire, put a plus one plus one counter on the 10th District Legionnaire and scry one. So, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about cards that go with feather so that when you target your own things, you also get even more value, such as a plus one plus one counter and you get to scry. The haste is kind of a bonus. It's even more about getting able to pump that creature up. I think this is a very good creature, and it's part of what's going to make that feather deck uh, what I want it to be, that heroic style deck. So I'm going to craft four of them and play them in the feather deck without question. I don't think it slots right into any other deck. I think it's specifically made to play with feather. Bio Essence Hydra, three blue and a green, four four trample Hydra mutant rare. When it enters the battlefield with a plus one plus one counter for each loyalty counter on planeswalkers you control, whenever one or more loyalty counters are put on planeswalkers you control, put that many plus one plus one counters on Bio Essence Hydra. This card is not good, but I think you're going to see a really fun Jang Tank episode that involves Bio Essence Hydra. Hawatli Radiant Champion, and Simic Ascendancy. And I just wanted to get that out there. Kiora Behemoth Beckoner is two and a hybrid Simic for a legendary Kiora Uncommon. It has seven freaking loyalty. And whenever a creature with power four or greater enters the battlefield under your control, draw a card. Minus one untap target permanent. So for three mana, you get seven loyalty. That's going to be very hard to kill. Next turn, you use the minus one to untap something like a land, use it to generate mana, and play a big creature, and you will draw a card. Is that good? I think it's good if a, if the Kiora can live from that point. So it's all about how much damage, when you play this on three, how much damage Kiora takes. In that way, it's like you're gaining life, and you're bridging yourself to a big creature. This is sort of like a good ramp spell that also has the potential to draw you a card. And in that mode, is it better than Gift of Paradise? Is it better than, what's the other one, uh, Grow From the Ashes? I actually think it is. The only problem I have with it is once it's dead, it doesn't do that anymore. But so if the opponent has this play pattern where you play your Kira, the opponent attacks it, say takes out half its loyalty, you minus it and use it to play some big five drop and you draw a card. Your opponent kills the five drop and attacks Kira again. You gained six-ish life and you drew a card but uh your card is gone and you're back to four mana maybe you have your fifth mana but hopefully you weren't planning to play a carnage tyrant next i don't know this card is interesting i'll probably try one of it here or there um and just see what it does it's one of those effects that's very hard to evaluate when you look at it in a vacuum but I think it could be decent for very specific decks. I still am not going to run out and craft around it and build around it. I would be excited to see it do something good, and you'll see me playing with it at some point in the format. Merfolk Skydiver is a green and a blue 1-1 one, one flying. Whenever the Skydiver enters the battlefield, you may put a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control, and for five mana prolif proliferate. Eh. There's so many better merfolk right now. Um, so if you're specifically playing with the plus one, plus one counter merfolk deck with Benthic Biomancer, maybe you want to try this. I feel like I'd rather have a Silver Gill Adept 100% of the time. I don't think this card is actually very good. I'll just try it here or there. The Proliferate for five is very expensive and probably not going to happen very often. You can put a counter on itself. So for two mana, you have a 2-2 two -two flyer, if nothing else. Maybe that's good enough. I don't feel like the Merfolk deck needed more cards though. So I don't think this is going to take the place of something like a, a, um, a Deep Root Elite, something like a, I already said it, Silvergill Adept, a Merfolk Mistbinder, etc., etc. Neoform is a sorcery. As an additional cost to cast the spell, sacrifice a creature, and it is a green and a blue. Is an uncommon. Search your library for a creature card with converted mana cost equal to one plus the sacrificed creature's converted mana cost. Put that card onto the battlefield with an additional plus one plus one counter on it and shuffle your library. So if you have a Llanowar Elf and you cast Neoform, you can sacrifice your Llanowar Elf and you can go get, say, 
a wild growth walker and it will enter the battlefield as a with as a one three with a plus one plus one counter so a two four it's basically how the card works add one to the casting cost pick a card out of your deck go get it um we're still trying to bring back birthing pod this is sort of a one-shot birthing pod prime speaker xanifer was the other card trying to bring back birthing pod a very popular card that got banned in modern because it was too good this card's all right I'm really not sold that we need it. As far as Jank Tank and theme decks, this is an automatic four of that I'm going to play with. As far as competitive decks, it all depends on if we can put together a chain of creatures that like, is that strong, is really that powerful. It's also very risky. If the opponent counters this card, you are down a creature and you got nothing for it. So that's kind of rough. The opponent can't counter it by removing the creature, but any kind of negate or counter spell makes this card a lot worse. However, if you sacrifice something like a Rekindling Phoenix and go fetch something like the next card I'm going to review, you are doing it, uh, getting a lot of value and a lot of power. And the plus one plus one counter is really relevant as well, as you can just set up all kinds of plus one plus one counter synergies with the cards that you fetch. So I like Neoform, I'm definitely crafting it. I don't know if the deck will turn out to be good. I don't foresee it being amazing. I'm really skeptical of decks like that. I would love to be wrong. Rollesque, the Apex Hybrid, is two green green and a blue. A legendary human mutant. It is a mythic, freaking rare. Flying Trample. When Rollesque enters the battlefield, put two plus one plus one counters on another target creature you control. So, right away, it's five mana for a six seven with... It, it has there has to be another creature for you to get to get the full payoff but you're getting like six seven in stats when it dies proliferate then proliferate again i mean who the hell is rollesque i mean this person in the story has a lot of power and look at him flying they look like a vampire but it's a human mutant all right um so proliferate then proliferate again so we put two plus one plus one counters on something else say on We'll just go really small. Say we put them on a Llanowar Elf, right? It's a 3-3 Llanowar Elf. Now say Rollisk dies. We proliferate, meaning the Elf becomes a 4-4, and then the Elf becomes a 5-5. Or how about if we had a Pelt Collector? Is that... Like, did we just... Did we just make, like, a 7-7 Pelt Collector? And that's just, like, the base. I mean, it's kind of crazy. This card is nuts. I think that I have to try one of them at least, and probably two, in the Simic and Sultai decks with a good creature base, and definitely with Neoform, the card that we just looked at before, as either when we fetch it with Neoform, it is awesome, or when we sacrifice it with Neoform, we get a double proliferate, which, depending what kind of board we're going for, could be insane if we have a bunch of small creatures with plus one plus one counters, or if we can ultimate a Planeswalker right away. It's it's pretty wild. I really like this card. I'm going to be excited to play with it. I It might be a force in standard. I think it has the stats to do it. It's all about the support staff and if a Simic based card like this can really take off. Next is Tamiya, the Collector of Tales. <laughs> Collector of Tales, huh? She and Hawatli should get together. They could do some poetry, sing some songs, tell some stories. They'll be great at a campfire. Two, a green and a blue, legendary Planeswalker Tamiyo Rare. Spells and abilities your opponents control can't cause you to discard cards or sacrifice permanents. Take that, Angrath's Rampage, I think the card was called. Take that, Nicole Bolas. Suck it, disinformation campaign. Hell no, not today. Plus one, and there's five loyalty here, by the way. Choose a non-land card name, then reveal the top four cards of your library. Put all cards with the chosen card name among them into your hand and the rest into your graveyard. <sighs> I'll read the and then minus three, return target card from your graveyard to your to your hand. Alright, I'm just gonna go with it. Best of three. MTG Arena. Plus one naming Nexus of Fate. Birdo. Ouchie. <laughs> So, ways to dig for Nexus every single turn. Just what we needed more of. Oh, good. And you throw the rest in your graveyard, so it continues to shrink your deck and make it more likely you'll find more Nexus. And more likely you'll find more Nexus. Okay. You could also name Root Snare if that's the card you need to stay alive. So, I think Tamio goes right into a Nexus deck. 
Just what that, just what we all needed. Nexus decks getting better. The minus three is fine. I mean, basically you're building your graveyard by plussing it. So eventually the minus three getting a key card back out of the graveyard means that if we run one Hydroid Crassus as our wing con and we mill it, it's not the end of the game. And the ability to basically protect your hand from Thought Erasure while doing your nexus -y things is pretty gross. So I think you're gonna see a little bit of Tamiyo Collector of Tales in best of three with Nexus. Will you see it elsewhere? I'm not sure. I don't know if any card has as much of a warping effect on the game that's worth playing a card to plus one and basically say throw four cards into your graveyard and get nothing for it. But maybe there's going to be enough um, discardy and sacrificey things that you get value in enough matchups. But I don't think this goes into most decks. I think it goes into a couple of decks and I wouldn't craft more than one or two to try it out. Finally, I get to craft Nicol Bolish Dragon Guard. <laughs> ah, maybe they'll hire me for voice lines someday. Although they, they made him sound a lot different in voice lines. I always pictured him as closer to Smog from the animated Hobbit. Something like that. Revenge. You know, something like that. Anyway, Nicol Bolas, Dragon God. This is, before I read it, well, now, let's read it first. Blue. Black, black, black. Red. Tough mana cost. Dude is feeling very, very, very black mana this time out. Mythic rare. Legendary Planeswalker. Bolas. Nicole Bolas, the Dragon God, has all loyal abil loyalty abilities of all other Planeswalkers on the battlefield. That includes your opponent's, and that includes yours. So, it has all loyalty abilities, not static abilities. So for example, your Bolas doesn't copy Tamiyo's static ability, the opponent can still make you sacrifice permanence. But Bolas will copy the plus one ability if you wanted to say plus one, name a card, look at your top four, throw them into your graveyard, and maybe hit that card, for example. Now, let's look at the rest of the abilities of Bolas. Plus one, you draw a card. Each opponent exiles a card from their hand or a permanent they control. That's basically plus one go up two cards. That is nutty. Minus three, destroy target creature or planeswalker. Most of the time, that's very similar to what Tammy or what Teferi does. Except for, you know, the destroy effect isn't as strong as say, put into deck because that's more like exiling and it can't hit artifacts and it can't hit enchantments. Minus eight, each opponent who doesn't control a legendary creature or planeswalker loses the game. I want to do a sound bite from aliens here, and I'm not good at the impression. I just want Corporal Hick, not Hicks, uh, Corporal Hudson go, uh, going, game over, man. <laughs> it's game over. What are you going to do now, man? Oh my God. So this card, first of all, while the ability to copy other loyalty abilities from other Planeswalkers is interesting uh, and will definitely jank tank it with, say, Sexy Jace, the Cunning Castaway, and a few other cards like Hawatli Radiant Champion and a bunch of creatures to add loyalty really quickly and ultimate it almost immediately, most of the time you're not going to worry about this line of text. In serious competitive games, it probably won't be as popular because you're either going to minus three and destroy their Planeswalker or you're going to plus one. This plus one is absurd. Drawing a card and exiling a card from the opponent's hand or destroying a permanent is such a problem. You go up two cards with every plus one. If you keep your bolus on the battlefield for more than two turns, you're up so many cards. That alone should be good enough. And of course, when you're up that many cards, a minus eight may as well end the game. This is my pick for the best card in the set because I think it finally gives Grixis the amount of power that it needs. The mana cost is tough, but with the Checkland mana base and the Shockland mana base, I have confidence that we can do it, that we can pull it off. I'll play freaking Chromatic Lantern if I have to. And I really hope that Nicole Bolas finally gets Grixis decks the respect they deserve, lets them compete head to head with the fairy decks by having an awesome Planeswalker that can run away with the game if the opponent is not set to answer it. And we still have cards like Thought Erasure to make sure that Bolas gets to do what Bolas needs to do. This card is sweet. This card is amazing. Sign me up for four of them. Four of them on day one. Niv-Mizzet Reborn. 
white, blue, black, red, green. You could also say Wooberg. <laughs> For a legendary creature, Dragon Avatar. It is a mythic rare flying. It is a 6-6. Six, six. When Niv Mizzet Reborn enters the battlefield, reveal the top 10 cards of your library. For each color pair, choose a card that's exactly those colors from among them. Put the chosen cards into your hand and the rest on the bottom of your library in any order. So you get one Dimir card, you get one Gruul card, you get one Simic card, etc., etc. Well, I don't think I have to tell you that this is going to be a hard card to make work in Constructed. Um, best of one or best of three. This is definitely a challenge mode jank tank card to me. I don't foresee it being a card that is in a serious competitive deck. However, that is an enter the battlefield trigger. Maybe there's a reanimator deck we can play with this. Connive Concoct is a card that we could get so that if it dies, we can just keep playing it over and over. And then the rest of the time, what are we doing? We're running Lantern of Insight maybe, something like that, so that we can cast all our other color pair cards. And we're making sure that we have a lot of color pair cards in the deck. Basically, five color Niv-Mizzet is gonna happen. It will happen at some point on the channel. It may not happen right away. Mythic rare, and I'm pretty much going to want four of them. That's quite a bit. We'll see. But I'm sure eventually you will get your Niv-Mizzet Reborn deck. Karn the Great Creator is four mana for a legendary colorless planeswalker Karn that is rare. Activated abilities of artifacts your opponent's control can't be activated. So you're the only one with the artifacts. I don't know if an artifact deck will be in standard anytime soon, but we'll see about that. Plus one, until your next turn, up to one non-creature artifact becomes an artifact creature with power and toughness each equal to its converted mana cost. Minus two. You may choose an artifact card you own from outside the game or in exile. Reveal that card and put it into your hand. Five loyalty at the start. So let's unpack the plus one. You can turn one of your artifacts into a critter to do some fighting and it lasts until your next turn so it can block as well. This is also worth noting. Plus one can target the opponent's artifacts. If they have a Mox Amber or artifact token or some zero cost artifact on the battlefield, this will kill it. So you can just go over there and kill their Mox Amber by turning it into a creature. You can also turn, say, their Immortal Sun into a creature. Never mind, that's a terrible example. The Immortal Sun turns off the Karn. You can turn, say, their... What else do people play? treasure map into a creature and then you could kill it with a removal spell or a Kai's Wrath. So that's interesting I think. Um, then on the minus two, choosing an artifact card you control um, or that you own from exile or outside the game and putting it into your hand is another reason to build sideboards in best of one or to have a toolboxy type sideboard in best of three. And you can go fetch some things. There is a combo with this. You can play it with Tezzeret, that card that gives you that gives affinity for artifacts. And then you can minus two to go outside the game, get Guardians of Koilos, which can return the Karn to your hand. Then you replay the Karn for free because of the affinity. And then you minus two to get the gar another Guardians of Koilos. And you just loop that so that you make four Guardians of Koilos and then do something else with it, like bounce your Tezzeret and then plus it to gain a bunch of life and do a bunch of damage. That's a pretty cool combination and something we might try in a jank tank. As far as constructed applications, I think the other Karn is better. It gains immediate uh, card advantage and continues to gain card advantage and has more loyalty over time on the battlefield than I think this will. Plusing this to make another artifact a creature also has downside. They can kill it. It's a big problem. So um, maybe as a tutor for the Immortal Sun is like one of the things I see this as. If you're a deck that doesn't want to really run the Immortal Sun necessarily, but would run the Immortal Sun if it were up against specifically a Planeswalker deck. Having a Karn in your deck that can come down and either fetch the Immortal Sun or go fetch something else like Treasure Map, something that would be a little more useful in the matchup, might not be a terrible idea. It's probably a little bit better if you are specifically talking about fetching cards like Sorcerer's Spyglass than a Mastermind's Acquisition because it leaves a Planeswalker behind which can have other effects on the game. Ugin the Ineffable. <laughs> this name is killing me. <laughs> Take back all the Fs we put into chat for Ugin. You cannot F with Ugin. 
is the ineffable. <laughs> Six colorless. Legendary Planeswalker Ugin. Rare. Colorless spells you cast cost two less to cast. Exile the top card of your library face down for a plus one. Look at it. Create a 2-2 colorless spirit creature token. When that token leaves the battlefield, and that can be for any reason, I might add, put the exiled card into your hand. So it's create a creature that dies, that basically when it dies, draws you a card. Minus three, destroy target permanent. That's one or more colors. Well, there's a lot of those around. Four loyalty starting. So. The minus is a pretty desperate one when you pay six for this card, but it's very similar to Teferi, very similar to Bolas. It can destroy target permanent that's one or more colors, so that's going to target most things that you would ever want to mess with in the format. It's destroy, it is an exile, so the minus isn't quite as useful as potentially a Teferi. The plus one is very good. Making a creature to defend the Ugin that also if the opponent removes that creature or if it chump blocks, you get to draw a card is very strong. This card is good. Six mana is a lot. So I see it going into decks where Teferi, the hero of Dominaria, or Nicole Bolas do not go. And that to me is, well, there's a lot of them. There's a Sultai deck. There's various big red decks that I think would benefit from this card. I don't know if color spells costing two less to cast is ever going to matter, but I do see this in a treasure map deck. So getting a free treasure map isn't the worst thing that could happen. And getting a Karn that's two mana less is probably fine. This probably works with treasure map Karn uh, to tie the jank room together even more for mid-range decks that aren't at the traditional mid-range decks of the format. So I like Ugin. I think Ugin's going to get some play. I'm going to craft probably two or three Ugins and see where it goes. Probably two to start with and just see how it plays in the format. I look forward to it. It looks like a very fun card right up my alley. I'm going to talk about Blast Zone here, and uh, my notes on a lot of these cards that are lands, uh, colorless lands that are here at the end, at the very, very, very back end of the set, at the down here to the wire in my review, my notes are going to be very similar. So um, I'm going to still read the card because I think it's interesting and we'll probably go in some decks, but then I'm going to say uh, for the rest of the cards, I'm going to say same as what I said about Blast Zone. So, Blast Zone is a land, it is rare, and when it enters the battlefield with a charge counter on it, you can tap it for a colorless, and for XX tap, put X charge counters on Blast Zone. So if you want to add one more charge counter to Blast Zone, you have to tap two mana and Blast Zone itself to do it. So it's like a three mana cost. You can do multiples at once. So if you tap four mana plus the Blast Zone itself, you can add two counters to your Blast Zone. Three mana tap, sacrifice Blast Zone. Destroy each non-land permanent with converted mana cost equal to the number of charge counters on Blast Zone. All right, so one thing that is interesting about this is it has to enter the battlefield with a charge counter on it. That means you can never sacrifice it to blow up tokens. It has to match the charge counters exactly. And one charge counter means if your opponent has an army of Josu Vest Lich Knight tokens and you sacrifice Blast Zone, it will not destroy those. It will instead destroy all the Llanowar Elves and all the Terramanders on the battlefield. This effect on a land is potentially powerful. It's not often you get a land with options to remove things. That said, it's a very expensive cost. Paying three mana and sacrificing the Blast Zone, basically stone raining yourself to kill something um, that is usually a bunch of one power creatures is interesting, but it does force the opponent to consider how many one drops they can deploy onto the battlefield. It doesn't enter the battlefield tapped, that means if your opponent has four one drops on the battlefield, like a white weenie deck might, on turn four, you can play this and immediately tap your other three lands and the blast zone and wipe them. Uh, that is pretty cool that it can come out of nowhere that way. The fact that you can build it up and try to build it to whatever the opponent's key permanent might be is also interesting against a control deck. You can build this up to five counters on the blast zone so that whenever the opponent plays their next to fairy, it's gonna die they're probably not going to be able to stop it. That is a pretty nice effect and a good mana sink. Here's the negatives of Blast Zone and a lot of the lands that I'm going to cover here on the way down the stretch. They tap for colorless mana. Right now, colored mana requirements are very important. 
Guilds of Ravnica and Ravnica of the Legions have pushed cards like Crackling Drake, Niv-Mizzet, Nicole Bolas, the Dragon God, Thought Erasure, Absorb, all these cards that make colorless mana a serious drawback, to the point that even a card like Field of Ruin isn't very good right now, despite the fact that Ascanta and Legion's Landing are very, are very popular in the format. This bodes poorly for Blast Zone, as well as all the other lands I'm going to talk about, and it's very likely that if your deck has a Kai's Wrath in it, you just should not play any Blast Zones. It is very likely that if your deck wants to absorb things around turn three, which you don't always need to do, but if your curve doesn't have many three drops and you think you'll need to absorb to keep from dying, you might not be able to run a Blast Zone. So you have to think about these things. Every time, every single time comments or Twitch chat tells me to run a Reliquary Tower, I ask them to actually look at my deck and its colored mana requirements. And you will see why Reliquary Tower is a poor card. Blast Zone is a much better card than Reliquary Tower and still may not see play because mana requirements are so important. That said, I like the card. I want it to make it. Maybe it's okay to make it the 27th land in your control decks, or the 26th land in your mid-range deck, or the 24th land in your aggro deck, just to have a little something extra. Although, aggro, that doesn't feel right to me. Anyway, it also depends what we're blowing up in the meta, so pay attention is the meta all about decks that are putting like four two drops onto the battlefield or a million one drops? Maybe Blast Zone is the answer. It also goes well with that zomb... <laughs> you can play it with that zombie uh, critter whose name I've forgotten that I reviewed what feels like an hour ago and remove a counter from it to draw a card. So there's always that. Emergence Zone. Add a colorless, sacrifice it, and a one to cast spells this turn as though they had flash. So picture it as being able to add two mana to the cost of any card that you have to give it flash. Is that worth it? In my humble opinion, no, not at all. There are some fun things you can flash in. You could flash in a Kaya's Wrath, a Star of Extinction. There's some bizarre stuff you can do, and maybe a one of Emergence Zone is fun in certain two color rampy style decks that use a lot of colorless mana, like my Electro Dominance deck, which can also flash things in, but no, I don't think this is a good card. I don't think I will be running it nearly as often as people tell me to. Interplanar Bacon. Freudian slip. Interplanar Beacon. Whenever you cast a Planeswalker spell, you gain one life. Add a colorless, one in a tap, add two mana of different colors. Use this to cast Planeswalker spells. Well, super friends. I'm just going to say super friends. You need a lot of Planeswalkers to make this worth it. Otherwise, all of those good spells like Kai's Wrath and creatures like Niv-Mizzet are going to hate you for playing this card. So, when we play Super Friends, we will play some Bacon. Karn's Bastion. Rare. Tap for colorless, 4 mana, and tap proliferate. So for 5 mana, you can use it to put additional loyalty or plus 1 plus 1 counters or whatever counters on any player or permanent, etc. Um... I could see one or two of this, like immediately what I see for this deck is putting it into a token type strategy with that already has unbreakable formation and other plus one plus one synergies and some planeswalkers. Maybe this could be a very good like bonus land in a green white token type strategy. Otherwise, once again, people are going to tell me to put this in every deck. All the things I said about Blast Zone apply to this card. Don't screw up your mana for it. Make sure that you can afford to have lands that produce colorless mana, that it's not going to ruin your ability to cast your spells when you need to, and cost you games. Mobilize District. Tap for a colorless mana, or for four mana, you can turn it into a 3-3 citizen creature token with, not token, creature with vigilance until end of turn. It's still a land. This ability costs one less to activate for each legendary creature and planeswalker you control. So for every legendary creature and planeswalker, the activation is cheaper. On its own without those things, this is a pretty good card. At four mana, you make the 3-3 and it has vigilance. So you can attack or block with it and then still cast something else or do something else with it. That's a pretty sweet deal. This is probably the best of the cards that taps for the colorless mana. Uh, you have to make sure that your mana base supports it. I could see running this, using this to get the uh, mana base in your red deck up if you want to play Experimental Frenzy and Rekindling Phoenix, but you don't want to flood out that badly. Being able to turn this into a threat that survives the Wrath of God is a big deal. 
I like this card even if you can't combine it with legendary creatures and planeswalkers, and I love this card if you get to reduce its cost even a little to defend your planeswalkers. So I like Mobilize District in Super Friends. I like Mobilize District in mono color decks like mono red, um, maybe even in mono white a little, but probably in addition to the mana base they already have to make them play a higher number of lands. It can also increase the quality of threats. We can play a few more expensive cards in those decks if we need to, because now we have Mobilize District holding it down. It doesn't, it, it, it can struggle with casting your like goblin chain rollers and stuff like that, so be careful. But I like Mobilize District. I think it's going to show up in tons of places. It might be one of in a ton of decks. It's definitely the best if you're going to throw one of these lands into your deck, regardless of what I say about color requirements, make it Mobilize District. Creature lands are very powerful and very cool. And that brings us to the end of the review for colorless and multicolored cards for War of the Spark. I'm going to take a moment now to say that these videos take a lot of work. They take their toll on the, my voice. They take time out of my day. And if you would like to support the video, there is a link to tip in the description. Also, if you join the channel and hit that join button on YouTube, it's $4.99 a month. You get access to some special emotes and badges for Super Chat if I do more live streaming in the future, which is something that I'm looking into. And you get a bonus video each month. This month, you are getting not just a bonus video, you are getting the review of the rest of War of the Spark, reviews for each color of deck. So look forward to that in the very near future. It will be available within the next day or two. Should be available about the time this video comes out for members who have joined the channel or supported the channel on Patreon. So hopefully, hopefully it's already ready for you. But please consider clicking the join channel and supporting the work that I do, the hours that I put in to provide you with MTG Arena content every single day. And to those who have and those who may continue to, thank you so much. It is truly a dream since I was a child, a 14-year-old a, a child, that someday all I would have to do is think about magic cards and do that for a living. And you are making it a real possibility. With support from people like you, it could really happen. Thank you also for watching this entire thing. You know that something I appreciate on my really, really long videos, please put in comments, stayed till the end because that lets me know that that average watch time might be 13 minutes, but that there are true fans out there, people who I really make these videos for, people who get me up every morning, inspired to try another new deck, another new video. Uh, they're the ones who watch till the end. So if you watch till the end, please let me know in comments. It makes my day, it warms my heart, it humbles me beyond measure. And to all of you who are listening right now, thank you so much for your support and making my YouTube channel uh, a real thing, something that I'm proud of, something that I have real hope for could be the future of your boy CGB. So whew, don't want to get all teary eyed about it. Join the channel <laughs> so you can watch the next videos where you'll get more of my funky thoughts on all the new cards. Thank you for watching this video. As always, I will see you in the next video. Goodbye.